Hello, I'm Judy Maggio with Kaler Use Decibel, and during this month, we are focusing on homelessness both from a solution standpoint and a problem standpoint. Where are we as a community and where do the solutions lie? And I have four people who are very close to the situation, three of whom are on the front lines helping people who are experiencing homelessness every day. First, we have Ann Howard, who is the Executive Director of the Indian Community Homelessness Coalition. We have Amy Price, who is Director of Development at Front Steps at the Arch. Then we have Heidi Sloan, who is with Community First Village. She's the director of the farming program there. And then we have District 6, Austin City Council Member Jimmy Flanagan. And I'm going to start with you, Council Member Flanagan, because one of the things that I've heard a lot about in the last several weeks since the council revised the rules dealing with people who are homeless is that everybody's up in arms and there's going to be tent cities everywhere and um, you know people have said they notice the homeless are more visible and they are seeing more tents so first I want you to explain in everyday terms it's been a lot of confusion what changes were made to this ordinance and how it's impacting the city sure so the the changes have have been um, talked about ad nauseum I think throughout the community and, and not every person participating in the conversation is doing it from an honest place. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to, to talk through this. There are three components. There's the sit lie, the camping, and the panhandling. One of the, the, the data points that's often left out is there are two court cases, federal court cases, that initiated this revision. One had to do with panhandling and the other had to do with camping, or, or the sit lie, which is uh, that there are First Amendment protections for speech, specifically, the court ruled that there's a First Amendment protection to ask for money. Now, that does not mean you can do it aggressively. It does not mean you can touch someone. It doesn't mean you can get up in somebody's face. So the panhandling ordinance was changed to be specific about being aggressive and aggressive behavior. So it's not even just a panhandling ordinance anymore. It clarifies aggressive behavior being prohibited. The other court case was related, it's out of Boise. It's a, it's a more recent court case that talks about uh, the ability to, to to exist, frankly, in public space as a, as a member of the community. And unless the city has a place for you to go, you cannot be asked to leave. And there's a million carve outs to this reality, but, but at a very basic level, unless there's someone somewhere to go, the, the city can't just keep telling you to move around a chessboard with never, with, with never giving you a place where it's okay to be. And so the camping ordinance was changed to, and the sit light ordinances were changed to address more specifically where those behaviors are prohibited so that it created a space where they weren't prohibited so that we could be complying with these court cases. Uh, there's been a lot of misinformation about them. Uh, the one part of it that, that is very frustrating to me is when I hear people talk about the camping ordinance as requiring it to be completely obstructing a sidewalk in order for it to be prohibited, but the word completely is not in the ordinance. The ordinance just says you cannot be obstructing the sidewalk for health and safety, or if it's uh, uh, limiting a, a safe passage, or if there's a you know health and safety kind of stuff. So there's quite a bit of discretion uh, for the department and for Chief Manley and others to interpret this ordinance in order to maintain a safe and healthy community. I wanna ask all of you, and I wanna drill down on the ordinance a bit, but has it impacted your work at all? Uh, because you are on the front lines dealing with homeless people every, every single day. Has this ordinance made a difference? For example, Amy, at, at the Arch. I think that what we're seeing is it has increased the public anger. People who don't understand what's happening have gotten up in arms on the social media. There's a rage that this has fueled like somebody has been given a license to kill. And that rage puts a target on the backs of a vulnerable population. And so that's bad, that's hard for us. Um, we see the hostility, we see it directed at our clients and we hope prospective clients. And it's heartbreaking. I mean, when people don't understand something or when they're afraid, that'll come out sideways as anger. And that anger is not good for a population that needs services and compassion. I think I agree with Amy and I think uh, Council Member, you did a great job explaining it. One of the biggest misconceptions is, was this just on 
public property or private property too. I've had a lot of people say, you're letting them camp in my yard or you know, not on, on my property. private property is camp. It's not right. on Private and that was property. something that was, uh, that was a big miss. miss yes, was put out there on social media. Yeah, and, quite and, a bit. and add to that, uh, the parks. There's still a camping prohibition overnight. Uh, uh, watershed areas, water quality areas, those are all still prohibited for health and safety reasons. Right. And I think we're going to see the city council come back and further restrict, you know, where camping sit and lie mm -hmm. and makes sense in Austin. I think another impact has been um, just. There are folks, there are people experiencing homelessness now coming out of the woods or knowing it is okay. I shouldn't be mm. arrested if I, um, you know, put, put my, my tent suitcase here. Or, or put a tent, tent under the or, overpass. Or put my tent there. Um, mm -hmm. Those things had been, you know, um, against the, the rules before and now it's okay. Um, that's not a bad thing. We need as a community to face the truth about the number of people experiencing homelessness. And when they were forced to hide, it made it difficult and actually more expensive to deliver services to them or prolonged them asking for help. Their health deteriorated. We were sending emergency vehicles into you know wooded areas. So this, I said earlier, you know, or last week, we have ripped the Band-Aid off. And I believe we're going to end up in a better place because with this facing reality, I think it's going to force us to create the public-private partnerships we need to advance the ball. But when you rip the Band-Aid off, sometimes the scab comes with it. It yeah. hurts. And, the, and this is what we're going through right now. And, and there's a lot of NIMBY going on. There's a lot of people saying, I, I don't want um, a homeless shelter in my neighborhood. I don't want uh, people setting up tents uh, near you know, an elementary school, whatever. Um, but, but it has become a lot more visible. One thing I want to know about is, is police enforcement as well. So is it, um, will they need a warrant, for example, to, to talk to someone who ha has a tent? Or is it, is it more discretionary, or how so does that work? let's address, if I can interrupt, the one and only Judy Maggio, <laughs> you know. Um, I don't know that it's all that more visible. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. we might have a few more tents, mm -hmm. but we had a tent at Olin Road and 183. Yeah. You know, we had um, People just see it setup. more because of this now, It's in ordinance. the conversation. Right. You know, you did mention the media talking about it so mm -hmm. much. I mean, if we said they might camp on Congress Avenue one more time, you know, um, we've talked about it a lot. Um, but we already had people living under bridges in, in groups with a lot of, with a lot of belongings. We've, we already had this stuff. So, and we already had law enforcement where you want to go next, you know, making decisions about we're not going to ticket those folks because, you know, it's not getting the result we need. So the, the number of tickets had really dropped down over the last couple of years. So this is really seen as a more humane approach to helping people um, who are facing homelessness because it, in essence, it's decriminalizing um, being homeless. And, and it's, I'm sure it's impossible for someone who's homeless to be able to afford if they do get arrested for public camping to pay for tickets and things like that. Those warrants that pile up. They're yeah. unanswered, mm -hmm. and those become an obstacle when you're mm -hmm. talking to a landlord, unless you're fortunate enough to be able to work with some place like Community First Village. Well, well I want to talk to you, Heidi, as, as we move into um, some of the things that are working and where we need to go from here. Um, I think that anyone who's ever been to Community First Village realizes it's a, it's a model that people all over the world are trying to, to replicate. Um, and it's very heartwarming to see people who've been lifted out of their uh, poverty or whatever, whatever thing that has put them on the street and have a place to call home and a community. So talk a little bit about what you all do and plans for the future. Certainly, yeah. Um, you know, Community First is, is my passion and it is the place that centers me and, and gives me hope every day. We entered into the Homes Not Handcuffs Coalition to work for these ordinance changes 
with um, other allies in the city of Austin to end the, the criminalization of homelessness because we believe deeply and from lived experience that relationship building begins with the recognition of a person's dignity. And so while, yes, painful ripping band-aids off, um, we have walked this path so many times with so many people of realizing that when we other those experiencing homelessness or with a background of homelessness, we are refusing to see their humanity. And sometimes that realization is very hard for people. At Community First, we host hundreds of volunteers every week, and we try to give each one of them the opportunity to realize that a person who has experienced homelessness is not other than them, that they are a person who for a time was without a place to stay, without a community to, to connect to, and we try to bridge that gap. It's not a gap that is created by people who have experienced homelessness. It is a gap between those who have and who have not. And so we try to um, bring that same dialogue into our spaces in a safe place where people can find healing and rest. Um, but I'm really delighted, uh, as hard as this conversation is in the city of Austin right now, that we are having these conversations outside of the walls of Community First as well, that um, the ability to recognize another person's right to exist, their right to agency, their right to come into the light is really beautiful and profound for us. I'm really impressed with the mayor and the city council for doing this. I mean, they, I look at their social media stuff too, and the complaints are epic. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's anywhere near a majority of the people. I'm inclined to think it's not. It's that vocal majority. But that took a lot of courage to just make these changes mm -hmm. and say we're trying to figure out what all the solutions are and how to yeah. pay for them, but we're going to start at a human level and quit targeting individuals. We had a training with the NAEH, National Alliance to End Homelessness, a couple of months ago. They work all over the nation. They know the best practices. One of the things said, don't have a citation, but one of the leading cause of death for people experiencing homelessness, people were guessing, substance abuse, whether, no, it was, it was heart disease related to stress if you have to break down your house every night, stash it somewhere and hope it doesn't get stolen, carry it with you. The stress of, un of, of interrupted sleep, a fear of harassment, maybe from a business owner who's uncomfortable with your presence, or maybe from a drunk who wants to you know, mess with you. My God, when you think about that day in, day out, mm -hmm. for what for some people is years, so kudos to the city for just going there and not waiting until they had a solution to say the human thing. But Council I mean, Member Flanagan, I'm imagining kudos is not probably what's filling your <laughs> inbox right now. Yeah, the, these issues are, are more complicated than mm -hmm. 140 characters on Twitter allows you to describe. And social media, I think as we're learning as a nation, is not a fair barometer of the public as a whole. Uh, but I think it is important to acknowledge that different parts of the community use different language when they describe these issues. So conversations around humanity and compassion aren't the only reasons why this was a good idea. People in this country have constitutional rights, and we have a responsibility to respect those constitutional rights. That, for me, was a big underpinning of changing these ordinances. It wasn't something that was invented in 10 days. It was something that council had been briefed on over many years, identified as legal issues and constitutionally uh, suspect enforcement. But more so than anything else, the ordinances weren't working. Mm -hmm. you, 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 if folks in the community can, uh, can say that there is more homelessness now, although there does not seem to be any evidence that in the last 30 days there was some explosion, that's not true. It's more akin to like, when you buy a new car and then you suddenly see that car everywhere. <laughs> I, I have That's emails. That's an interesting analogy, but right? yes, I understand, I have, yeah. I have emails in my inbox from the day I was sworn in complaining about people experiencing homelessness under overpasses in my district. The day after the ordinances passed, I had emails in my inbox claiming it had never happened before today. Well, obviously it had, and it had been happening. And the only real substantive change is that a few of those folks that were sleeping open air on mattresses are now in tents. That's not that big of a deal, frankly. Now, 
there are a lot of folks on social media primarily who are invested in undermining the work of the council and undermining the city of Austin as a whole. And deliberate and overt misinformation about these ordinances and the implication that the ordinances changes are the only thing that the city is doing or that anyone believed that the ordinance changes were the only solution that was required. I had a constituent call my office and tell my staff, I don't wanna hear about what he's doing, I just want him to fix it. Well, I can't wave a magic wand and fix it overnight. And if you don't wanna hear what we're working on, you won't think I'm fixing it. Well, let's talk about what this city is working on. Is it about 2,200 people, as is what I've read, experiencing homelessness on a regular basis? Per night, let's say, in the city of Austin. Mm -hmm. Is that right, Ann? So 2,200 is a number like tonight. Yeah. I think we could go find 2,200. There'd be about half of those in shelter, and we could find another 1,000 or 1,200 outside. But we know from the work we all do together that over the course of the year, we have, you know, five to 7,000 people that are experiencing homelessness in our community. Right now, we have a list of 3,500 households. It might be a single person, might be a family with children, but 3,500 households who need our help, who've said, you know, I'm homeless, we've confirmed they're homeless, and they need assistance. So that's the magnitude that we're trying to resolve. I think it's important to acknowledge, too, that there's a, a profound number of people that are imminent. There's a legal definition for homelessness that the feds put together to see who qualifies for certain programs. People that are doubled and tripled up. People that are living in a place that's not really fit for human habitation. I mean, I think that we all know on any given day, those people experiencing homelessness that you'll see out of doors or in a shelter. We get calls all the time from people. Look, my sister-in-law lives with me. She was a victim of domestic violence. She's here with her two kids. We can't, we have to move back to live with mom do you have a place for her? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know how, how many calls they must have made, and now they're calling the, uh, the adult men shelter. And, you know, the answer is no. If I give them a number, they've probably called it. Mm -hmm. There's a shortage not only for the people that we can see that are homeless, but those people that are imminent, living paycheck to paycheck or already doubled and tripled up and desperate. Well, what is the phrase, we're all a paycheck away from being homeless? Yeah. I mean, it, it could happen so for so many different reasons to so many different types mm -hmm. of, of human beings. Mm -hmm. I think that's important to note is that what we're just, we're talking about um, crisis that happens in a very expensive place to live. Mm -hmm. And so some of us can better weather the storm, whether we lose a job or we suffer a bad illness that takes us out of work for a while or families dissolve. Um, if you don't have the money to keep paying your rent or, or your mortgage and those things happen to you, that can push you into homelessness. We also have a lot of young adults who have, you know, been living in the foster care system mm -hmm. or, or been in and out of the juvenile justice system um, that, that have really nowhere to go. It's time for them to be on their own and it's how do they yeah. make that work? And so there's a big initiative right now. I'm very proud of the work that Austin's doing to end youth homelessness by 2020. We already have seen um, less, uh, you know, a reduction of 50% in the number of young adults on the street. So I think you're gonna see Austin of being, just like we ended veteran homelessness and created a system to handle any new vets that we find who are homeless. I think you're gonna see that success again with youth homelessness. So let's talk about solutions. For sure. example, youth homelessness. What has worked to reduce those numbers? Right, so we, with lots of energy, identify who are the young adults that are already experiencing homelessness, or as Amy said, at risk of homelessness, and we get all their names on a list. It's a big list, right, of several hundred young adults. And then we begin working with them on what is the intervention that individual needs. For a lot of them, it's access to a place to live. I mean, it, it's sort of, you know, goofy, right? You gotta have housing and support systems and community. 
And so the number one intervention, we call it rapid rehousing. It doesn't mean because it's fast, but it means because if we can connect that individual to a safe place to live, within a period of time, they'll be able to survive independently of government. Okay. And get a job. And get and, a job yeah. and, you know, have income. Maybe with young adults, it's about going back to school or job training. A lot of folks need to be connected to health care <coughs> so that they can stabilize with whatever they're dealing with. Um, I was just looking at the data this morning, and our, our nonprofit community is strong. About 85% of the folks that are using this rapid rehousing intervention those clients do not return to homelessness. That's pretty power. I mean, my mom said, you gotta make an A, and if you make a B, I want a reason why. Our nonprofit community is making A's and B's when it comes to getting people off the street and staying housed. We're just not doing enough of it. Well, and also one of the problems is obviously there's not enough places like Community First or like the new Salvation Army <coughs> shelter they're building for women and children. So what are some other solutions? What are some of the things that are working at Community First Village? Why do you think you have such a good success rate there? Right, thanks for that. Yeah, at Community First, we, um, as Anne was saying, we deeply recognize that homelessness is not just a housing issue, that it is related to a lot of complex societal problems. Um, and, and a lack of a social safety net at the end of the day. And so at Community First, in addition to providing permanent supportive housing for individuals ho who have experienced chronic homelessness, we also provide um, a lot of collaboration amongst groups from the community. So on site we offer um, clinical care, both uh, mental health care and physical care. We have um, dentists coming out now and taking care of people's teeth, but also caring for people's spirits. We have churches that come out and serve. We have a movie theater. We have a farm, um, a woodworking shop, an art studio. We provide the opportunity for people to earn a dignified income to find their purpose and what wakes them up in the morning, the thing that they can engage in. And it all ties back to this relationship where we believe that empowering communities into a lifestyle of service alongside people who have experienced homelessness really bridges the gap between those two. So when you get those two groups of people really working together and building long-term lasting relationships, that's where the stability of our community is really the strongest. You know, one of the things is about the partnerships. We've been really fortunate. We have faith-based folks that come in and help with our clients' needs. But it's, I mean, I think one of the city's successes is aiming for a homeless strategy officer. We're all at work, head down working. You don't always have the luxury of connecting with everybody else doing this. Picking somebody who's going to be looking at all the moving parts, I think makes sense. Don't know where it'll go, what it'll be, but I think anybody that's looking at all of that, trying to avoid duplication of services, bringing outside things in. We had a, a gentleman, a businessman downtown, and he came to me the other day and he said, look, for many years, a lot of the downtown business owners have been so frustrated by this problem. It, we worry about the safety of our staff and our patrons. It looks terrible and it's frustrating and it doesn't seem to get better. And we've been frustrated perhaps with the arch because it seems like an anchor for the problem more than a solution. But we realized something the other day. You're really working hard to house people. You got 426 people in housing last year. You're who we need to work with. We've been waiting for the cavalry to ride in, you know, horses and, and hats and flags. Nobody's coming. It's you and it's us and what can we do? And these public-private partnerships. That's I right. I mean, that's the truth. And I know? think really um, this is the opportune moment with the emails that you're receiving and the people that I'm talking to and the folks that you're serving every day to say to the community of Austin, yes, we have a problem and we hear that it is impactful in your life in this way and impactful in your life in this way. What is our collective end goal? And do you want to be part of that? There, there are folks who are describing the situation as being new, which we know that it's not. There are folks who describe the situation as the city is not doing any work, when, when in fact that it is. But it's also important to note what is new right now. You can go back into the media archives and find examples of shelters or homeless 
services being proposed in parts of town that got shut down, that couldn't get through a council vote, that couldn't get through the public process. In fact, a lot more of those examples than you can find of getting new services on the ground for the homeless community. Community first, for example. Community <laughs> first. We're Several proposed city locations <laughs> before in uh, And I believe the where the soccer before stadium is going was one of those mm -hmm. locations. Yes, so yeah. some of the same folks who then put, who is now, who have now petitioned to try to undo that, claiming that it should be for affordable housing, opposed <laughs> that project when it was slated for that location. So <laughs> it is important to note that, that there have been efforts that have failed those efforts are no longer going to fail because this council is committed to getting it done. It's also important to note that the ordinances, the changes in the ordinances are not designed to make it more visible so that we can do this. We are already committed to do this. And you can see that in the city's strategic plan where the number one and number two issues were homelessness and housing. That was decided you know, a year ago before the ordinance changes came, came to the council. There's no lack of commitment. We have dedicated more resources, financial resources to this problem than any other council in history. With convention center expansion and partnership with the tourism and the hotel industry, <coughs> we're gonna add another four to $10 million on top of that. But yet again, there's a movement to try to undo that which we'll, uh, uh, we'll see on the ballot this November. The convention center's another round table. <laughs> <laughs> Except so for the different. fact that it, it dovetails yes, with this true. issue does, because, because, because the... private industry is going to invest right. Right. in this. And, and the, same <coughs> folks who, who, the same folks who are claiming that government cannot solve this problem, that government can only make it worse, that if you make it easy to be homeless, more people will want to be homeless, which is bonkers, those same people are saying, you know, the only way to, so to solve it is with private and churches. Except those people are not tweeting at churches, demanding them to do the work. They're just tweeting at me, demanding that I not do the work. So what's the solution? The solution is what these folks here are doing, and it's public-private partnership. And going to, to churches in my own community that we're meeting with in far northwest Austin, one of whom used to do this. There's a house on their property that used to house three families in this house. And a number of years ago, the city came out inspecting the building and found that the, the fire suppression sprinklers had broken. Well, the church couldn't afford to repair them, so they shut down the operation. These are things we can solve, but it does require the public-private partnership. And it cannot be as simple as being cruel in order to prevent homelessness. Cruelty has never solved a problem, not in America. The voters, you know, thankfully voted for a humongous affordable Largest housing. Largest one in the history of the city. Yeah, $250 million for affordable housing. And the city is approaching that money different than the first two bonds in that they're making sure that some of that creates housing that welcomes people who've been experiencing homelessness. Because we not only have an affordability issue when you're talking about getting people off the street, Sometimes they're facing other barriers. If you've been evicted before, that's a mark against you to become a renter again. And so there's things like that that we have to work through to help people get back into housing. I wanna talk about next steps. Um, I know the council's been on break and you're gonna be meeting uh, August 8th, I believe. And I, and I understand that the city manager is also going to be weighing in on how things are going when it comes to ordinance changes and where we need to go with, with the homeless situation. What are some of the next steps to get more people off the streets and into permanent supportive housing? So um, one, we've heard clearly from Mayor Adler that he's expecting to hear from the uh, city manager um, on you know the resolution to do we need to restrict camp sit and lie where should it where can it make do, where does it make sense in Austin and to offset those restrictions how can we increase the capacity here to offer people a safe place to sleep and get access to housing resources and so I'm hoping we see a commitment to an expansion of shelter and housing programs um, so I, I think that was already planned, as, as Jimmy said, you know, that was already the commitment to address homelessness. 
but I'm hoping this is part of that, how do we heal after ripping the Band-Aid mm -hmm. off? Let's do this thing. Let's implement the mm -hmm. action plan to end homelessness. We're let's seeing. get up behind, excuse me just a second, you know, uh, um, let's make sure Community First expands through phase two. Let's make sure Integral Care opens their new um, mm -hmm. housing complex. Let's make sure LifeWorks helps us lead the effort to end youth homelessness. Let's launch the Pay for Success initiative that's gonna help 250 chronically homeless mm -hmm. folks off the street. So there's there's so much happening that's really powerful. I think Austin really, the country needs Austin to, to implement these big initiatives because they're gonna help other communities do what Austin mm -hmm. does. Amy, next steps. We're seeing changes at the arch. Right. What we've learned about homelessness has changed. Uh, it used to be, you know, you need to get sober, get a job, get a house. Now all the data, well, it has been for a while, but you know, you get cumulative data, shows that your chances of, of getting clean, getting healthy, getting a job are increased if we just stick you in a house. That doesn't mean there's a house, and it doesn't mean it's a house, it means it's a place. But we are gonna be working with some new changes at the arch. We have folks who have become comfortable not accepting case management, just having a place to lay their head. Mm -hmm. We're going to be able, we hope, to convince them, look, to be able to stay here now, you're gonna to have to accept case management. We want a housing plan. We gather that this has become an institutional setting that you're comfortable in, but that's not the plan anymore. Yeah. You're gonna need a housing plan and case management. It's gonna be hard. There's gonna be some of our clients who are gonna feel pushed and pinched by that, but we're going to be testing this going forward. I think we shift over in August. If you're staying at the Arch at night, if you're accessing our services, it's because you're working with case management to get housed. And we, we're accepting on faith and conviction talking to others that there will be housing mm -hmm. options. Mm -hmm. But we are shifting gears and it, maybe it'll turn the tide for some people. Maybe folks that have been chronically homeless will say, you know, it wasn't so bad. I accepted case management and it worked. I think they have a jaundiced view of failed efforts in the past mm -hmm. and you get used to anything. We, we actually have pretty powerful, you know, stories and data that shows if you, if I say, uh, Jimmy, please work with me, you know, actually I can't get you, you know, anything right now, but keep talking to me, they want to have nothing to do with you. But if I say, Judy, you're on the list, can, we can get you into, you know, a safe place to live in the next month, will you work with me? You say, absolutely. You know, people have had to wait for so long that they've lost a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we gotta work together and feed the spirit and feed the hope mm -hmm. and get folks moving along their house. I've heard that Front Steps has buttons that say like, what's your housing plan? Yeah. And we I just applaud to shift those the buttons. Yeah. Because yeah. That, Not are you safe tonight, but yeah. what's your housing what's, plan? Yes, yeah. the, the next you know, we, you know, we, we have to do. We have a client board member who's at uh, Community First Village and hearing him talk, I think it inspires a lot of our other clients and certainly some of the older ones who maybe have been you know homeless 5, 10, 15, 20 years, maybe in the Travis County area, maybe a little further mm -hmm. afield, but hearing about those transitions and that somebody can anchor down in the community and it works makes a world of difference. And you know, um, Community First is expanding. We are building phase two right now. We're gonna be moving even more people in in the next year and we're so excited to bring more people home. Our wait list is, is like every other wait list. It is longer than we want it to be. Um, in addition to that, I just want to pick up on what Jimmy was saying, that there is no silver bullet to this effort and the wait lists are real. And whatever brilliant initiatives we're coming up with today will take steps to implement and it will take time to implement. And so, um, while we are operating in that good faith and while we are moving towards solutions, I want to acknowledge the real needs of people who are going to be living out for a while and their neighbors who are not. And so I see the city talking about things and, and working on initiatives. I mean, shout out to Parks and Rec and the Watershed Department. Oh my gosh, amazing work to keep people safe, to give people resources, things like trash collection, things like considering laundry facilities, shower facilities, restroom facilities, places that people can be um, experience more of their own humanity and become more pleasant neighbors for others. Um, services that go out into these places where we know people experiencing homelessness are in need 
and meet them there in a way that says, actually the needs of those living um, under an overpass don't have to be at odds with their neighbors. Actually, everyone wants somewhere clean to live. Everyone wants somewhere safe to live. And so I think that's a really wonderful and hopeful thing that the city is working on that says, we are going for this long term and we're all moving full steam ahead. In the meantime, we're gonna get to know each other as neighbors and we're gonna get to see how we can build each other up. Next steps. I think Councilman it's Hunt. important to remember that unlike other levels of government where a thing is done and then two years later the legislature comes back or you know, can you even get a law passed in Congress right now, who knows? But at the city council level, it is more akin to constant process improvement. So you, we make the ordinance changes, we come back and we hear how it worked. We can make more changes, we can hear how it worked. You, we can iterate through these ideas more rapidly, especially with the council we have right now, which is unified in this being our most important issue to address. So part of the next steps is getting the shelter in South Austin opened, getting the funds necessary to the Salvation Army to get their operation expanding, seeking out other locations and other solutions and acknowledging that every district in the city, all 10 districts, have a role to play and a solution that works for their community. And it's going to be difficult. And it's going to be frustrating for a community in Austin, at least, that is accustomed to 10 years of conversation before we make a decision. <laughs> we, we, we don't have that time. We yeah. didn't have it 10 years ago. Right. We didn't have that kind of time on traffic. We didn't have that kind of time on affordable housing. We don't have that kind of time on homelessness. And this council, in my opinion, this mayor and this council is ready to make the hard decisions to get it done. I thought it was great that y'all were very clear managing expectations from the beginning. This is not just Ann Kitchen. There's going to be something everywhere. Yes, and don't, don't think, woo, we dodged that bullet. You will all need and will be eventually finding out what's going to come into your community. And, and we'll credit, to, credit to Council Member Kitchen for identifying a property and being first amongst the districts outside of District 9, obviously, to, to, to make that move. And, and I'm certainly looking proactively for how District 6 can bring its solutions to the table. So my final question is this, or request is this. Please give me one myth you'd like to debunk about homelessness as, as a, the final part of this discussion because I think that there are quite a few misconceptions and things that have gone on and on and on and um, I'd, I'd like to know from people who have studied this issue in our community for a long time what, what misconception or what myth do you want to debunk and I'll start with you Ann. Sure, thank you. I'd like to debunk the myth that the more we offer, the more people will come here, or, or maybe the, the myth is that these folks have all come here because they heard we do something right. The data shows us that about 75% of our people experiencing homelessness here in Austin Travis County are from Austin Travis County. These are our people, these are Texans. Um, and so uh, people need to know that the the kinds of money we're spending and the strategies we're using are also being used in San Antonio and Dallas and Waco and you know all up and down I-35. And so we need to do the right thing and not worry that we're gonna be attracting someone else's people experiencing homelessness. These are our folks struggling right here in Austin, Texas. Amy? It's not a choice. I mean, as you say, when we make people other, it's easier to convince yourself of that. It's hot out there, except when it's cold out there. It's uncomfortable, you're vulnerable, you're at risk. There are a lot of causes. Some of them are health and mental health based. Some of them are financial. The number one reason people aren't housed when we survey, can't afford housing. It's not a choice, it's just a reality. Maybe it was a slippery slope and it started with a healthcare problem and they couldn't go to work and they worked somewhere where there was no insurance. Then they lost their apartment. You might get used to it, but it's not a choice. Nobody chooses that, nobody. I've yet to meet any client or potential client who chooses this. Amy? Um, I think the idea that folks okay. who are experiencing homelessness are lazy, that actually um, we do a thing called street retreats where we go and spend the night with our friends who are still without housing and 
the number of times that I've been cared for in that context that I've been shown to a quieter corner or someone has gotten me cardboard or someone has helped me to find food and to know that that is people's every day, that they are waking up and making it work, that they are finding a way to rest, that they are finding a way to get care, that they are finding a way to go to appointments when everything is against them and everything is complicated. That is a hard life that in my perception is quite the opposite of someone who is lazy, mm -hmm. but of someone who, of whom so much is demanded every day. Thank you, Heidi. And Council Member Flanagan. Uh, my number one issue is, is this notion that um, if we're just cruel enough, the, the problem will go away. But, but the other one, you know, we now know what you have to do to address this problem. There are examples in other cities, namely Houston and Salt Lake City, that have really gone after the housing first model, where you, you prioritize getting someone out of the street, off the streets and into a safe place, and then wrap the services around in order to get them healthy, get them stable, get them into the workforce, and then into independence. Those communities, Salt Lake and Houston specifically, have seen dramatic reductions in their homeless populations, and it hasn't then suddenly driven thousands of more people. We are not turning into San Francisco or turning into Seattle. The amount of people experiencing homelessness in those communities is orders of magnitude per capita greater than we have right now. Is there a point at which the problem is too difficult to solve? I don't know, but Austin is not gonna find out. Mm -hmm. We're gonna solve this problem right now. Councilmember Flanagan, Heidi Sloan, Amy Price, Ann Howard, thank you all for sharing your perspective on a problem that Austin is trying to tackle in a, I would say, a very Austin way. <coughs> and we wanna thank all of you for your time uh, watching this and we are going to be talking about homelessness during the entire month of August on Decibel and look for our special, our episode on Decibel uh, at the end of August. So make it a good day and thank you so much for tuning in.